I introduce everybody, I'm going to read a letter dated February 7th, 2014, addressed to the Governor's Council. Dear Councilors, I'm pleased to nominate Marjorie Times to the position of Associate Justice of the District Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Sincerely, Maura Healy, Governor. Good afternoon, Ms. Knox. Good afternoon. Uh, I know you have some distinguished people here today, so, and I believe I have a witness list. I think I have the witness list. I do. We see the Honorable Judge O'Malley. I'd like to hear from you first. Oh, no, thank you. Good afternoon, Councillors. As uh, Councillor Ionella indicated, my name is Daniel O'Malley. For six plus years, I was the first justice of the Stoughton District Court. In my capacity as first justice of the Stoughton District Court, I came across dozens of lawyers. I'll start by saying that Marjorie Tynes was not only one of the best lawyers who ever appeared before me, she was the best. She was the best lawyer who ever appeared before me in the Stoughton District Court. Everyone in the Stoughton District Court is excited about Marjorie's nomination. I must have got seven or eight texts this morning from people saying, please give my best to Marjorie. We can't wait to see her as a judge and come in. And we, you know, some of them said it'd be nice to see her replace you because I'm out now. Anyways, I'm just going to read from what I uh, just I want to put into the record what I wrote to the JNC uh, back in October. And uh, Marjorie is always prepared, always ready for whatever event as to which she appeared in court on a particular day, always respectful to court personnel, opposing counsel in the court, always thorough in her presentation and always attentive to her client's needs. She is a true professional. She's a fierce advocate who works hard and fights hard for her clients, and she's never offensive to anyone. In addition to her knowledge, good afternoon, counsel. In addition to her knowledge of the law, she has uh, common sense, instinct, and humility and confidence at the same time. This might sound um, oxymoronic, but it isn't. She's got this confidence about her, but she is humble. She's a terrific lawyer, as I said. She'll be a terrific judge, but she's even a better person than she's a lawyer. She's a mother. She's come into her into our court with her kids. One of them, I have a picture. I couldn't find it. A picture of her daughter on the bench, on the bench with a gavel. And I said, "Now there's a real judge." <laughs> so, but I can't say enough things about her. I'll just close with one little vignette just to tell you about how Marjorie operates. I had a case uh, several years ago. Um, in uh, the second session of the district, Stoughton District Court, which nobody wanted to sit in the second session. It's just lousy in there. So I was in a bad mood before I got there. And I got there, Marjorie's representing some guy who's charged with trafficking. So trafficking weight of a uh, controlled substance. I was unsure at that time whether it was cocaine, crack cocaine, uh, 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 heroin, fentanyl. We didn't know what it was, but trafficking weight. So very serious charge. And Marjorie's up there and she's arguing on behalf of the guy that I release him. I'm not going to release a guy on a trafficking charge. Now, okay, so, um, and the Commonwealth did not move for dangerousness. But uh, anyways, well, she's up there and she's going on and on and on. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there now, and she tells me that what was found in the gentleman's back seat was fertilizer. That was the middle of the winter. Middle of the winter. She's got fertilizer in the back seat. So I said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's good fertilizer, huh? Yeah. In February, you know, right around with fertilizer, Miss Times, you want me to buy that? And she does that dip, she does it, and she says, yes, that's exactly what I want you to buy. He said, just give me a, a few days, give me a week, give me the case, and I'll come back, and I'll show it. Now, if that were anybody else, I don't think I would have entertained it, but it was her, and I trusted her. I trusted that she must know something I don't know, even though I... I get off the bench. I said to my clerk, I believe Marjorie's trying to sell this. Guy's riding around with fertilizer in the winter. Um, so then a week later, whatever it was, come back, gets tested, it's fertilizer. So, and no, she was walking around Stoughton Court like a peacock. 
<laughs> what? And she should have. And I think the next time she came in the session, I went like this. <laughs> That's Marjorie. Terrific lawyer, terrific person, mother, wife, and my friend. I would ask you. Thank you. Any questions of the judge, Counselor Jacobs? Hi, thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask you about your experience um, with Marjorie, with the attorney time. It, was it always when she was in private practice as a as a defense, or have you also experienced her? Both. You have. Yeah, both. I've seen her represent appointed people. I've seen her represent private people. And unlike some of the appointed counsel, she represents those appointed people as vigorously as she did the private people. That fertilizer fellow, we we'll use a little alliteration, he, that was a, a, a pointed case. So her vigor is just as just as good an advocate regardless oh, of yeah. she's have you also seen her when she was in her uh, working with the da's office of, uh, no, of the no i didn't i didn't know her back then but i knew mm -hmm. of her and i actually had cases against her husband years ago 20 years ago so in the roxbury uh division of the bmc wasn't called that back then uh, but no i never knew marjorie till i came into stoughton and people told me right off the bat wait till you get a load of this one <laughs> and uh and i said "Ooh, wow they're right no, thank she, you very much. I, she's something special. Really. Thank you very much. Well, good to see you again. Good to see you. Yeah, I'll do it to the vein. Great to see you. Thank you. Yes. How many, uh, since I've been on? Oh, I don't, I've been off and on, as you know. But I'm all done now. When first were appointed? On oh, 98. 1998 to 04. I understand. And then 16, 16 to 23. And, For your service. Oh, I, I, I've changed that 70. I keep on. I find someone to do it. But let, let me ask you something. Yeah. Um, that, that was an interesting case. Is there anything, any other case that really impressed you about her? Yeah, I'll give you another one, right? Because I was going to leave with that one, but I like to fertilize for this. <laughs> so uh, she was doing an OUI trial once, and there was an out of jurisdiction officer whom uh, testified first wasn't a local uh, police officer in one of the Stoughton uh, uh, court police departments. And he absolutely killed it. I mean, he had this defendant dead to right. And I'm thinking like, you know, what's she gonna do now? You know, and then uh, it was a, an absolute loser of a case when he was all done. Remember I told you, he one of the best witnesses I ever saw. Marjorie crossed him, but then knew enough to stop because he was too good. So she didn't want to keep him up there. Then the arresting, who was the low, local officer, got up there, and, and he was, had been sequestered. Marjorie cross-examined him, and the, whole, the Commonwealth's whole case went down the drain. Even the DA, the DA, when it was done, he would look like because <laughs> she just brought out the truth, you know. And uh, it was, it was, it was neat. It was one of those great moments where you see a really good advocacy. You know, a lot of lawyers would have pled that case out. Yeah. She didn't plead it out, you know, especially with that out of jurisdiction witness who I'm sure she interviewed before and knew this guy was really good, but that's that. And there's many others. She, other ones she would do pro bono. Like I would see her in the court and they maybe didn't qualify, they didn't want counts. I would say, attorney times, we put this case on for a day. You're gonna, I can't appoint you. Or even say, I can't appoint on certain cases. Well, you just track it and uh, if you're on, uh, absolutely. And then I'll never hear about it again. You just step up to people. That's why I'm so happy for I love the district court, having off and on been a judge in there since 98. And uh, we all know how important the district court position is. And I'm thrilled for the Commonwealth. And the all the nominees say it's the people's court. It is. You know, and I know judges like Judge Parker. <laughs> So, so thank you for your service. I hope you're enjoying your time and you look good. Oh, oh thank you, Counselor. Great to see you. Thank you. And your testimony means a lot to us. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again, Judge. Thank you very much. Thank you. You have another witness? I do. Good, good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen um, and counselors, my name is Esther Lene. I'm an attorney um, that in practice with Laundry. And um, I'm not going to do off script <laughs> like your honor. So I won't stick to my script. Um, right. Picture this third year in law school, first pregnancy, a few months before taking the bar exam, 
A woman finds out during a routine doctor's visit she is about to deliver her first child prematurely. Family friend comes to, the visit, comes to visit her at the hospital. And at the moment, the woman and her husband are being told to sign release forms because a C-section is most likely necessary. Friend, who is also a law student, immediately springs into action and begins to vigorously comb through the release forms, crossing out sections, inserting comments, and having mom to be initial each amendment. This was my first opportunity to have a front row seat of attorney Marjorie P. Tyne's flawless lawyering um, skills during one of the most vulnerable moments in my life. I immediately recognized that the world was about to witness an impeccable attorney who would be a force to reckon with. She is a triple threat. Not only is attorney time calm, cool, and collective in any situation, but she would show up and deliver at any moment's notice. Fast forward to a couple of years later, attorney Times and I had the opportunity to work together serving as prosecutors for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. During the endless hours inside and outside the courtroom, I was mesmerized by how Attorney Times represented the people of the Commonwealth with compassion and zeal, all the while maintaining a jovial and positive attitude. Our offices were at one point a few feet away from each other in the major felony unit. Again, allowing me to witness her behind the scenes, prepping her cases and thoroughly evaluating the evidence before her. As an ADA, attorney times was respected by all she interacted with, regardless of whether it was a judge, clerk magistrate, witness, defense attorney, probation officer, police officer, or a defendant. So it was not surprising to see that rapport transcend after she left the DA's office and opened her own law practice. While serving as a solo practitioner, I will never forget the moment when I heard a prospective client say to her, I want to hire you because I remember watching you on someone else's case as a prosecutor. And that moment, I knew that the person was going to be convicted. As good as you were in that case, I know you will represent me well. And that she did. Both private and appointed clients never shied away from telling attorney times and others how glad they were to have her represent them. Having had the opportunity to know and work with attorney times all these years, there was never a doubt in my mind that she would be here before you all today. Her heart, drive, compassion has a way of attracting and motivating others to give and be their best. It is my distinct honor and privilege to speak on behalf of my friend, my attorney, my colleague, my fellow bar advocate, she will be an exemplary judge and serve this Commonwealth well. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Councilor Devaney? Um, who's the district attorney? Um, Dan Connolly. Yeah. Oh, great guy. Yes. I missed him when he left. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how long did you work together? We worked together. I was at the DA's office for five years. Um, we were close together in the major felony unit for about a year, but um, we all had different district courts that we attended. And uh, at one point, I was in West Rockbury. She had just left West Rockbury, so she went to the superior court before me. So, it's out, been out, of, out of all the qualities that she has, what do you think is her best quality to go on the bench? Humility. Is that right? Yes. That's great. That's great. Yeah. How about compassion? Oh, compassion, definitely. Yeah. And that's part of the humility. When I say humility, you know, when you're humble, you're able to be compassionate and to um, see things from all perspectives. Well, yeah, your, your testimony was heartfelt. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, I would like to introduce the uh, counselors who are present to my right, Councillor Marilyn Petito Devaney, to my left, Councillor Tara Jacobs. Next to her, Paul DePaolo and Councillor Eileen Duff. And it was, it's good to see you, uh, Ms. Tynes. At this point, we'll hear your presentation, but before we hear uh, why you think you'd be a good addition to the district court, if you have family and or friends you would like to introduce, now is the time. Thank you. You've heard from the witnesses, the Honorable Judge Romali and Attorney Esther Lene. 
my mother, Carmen Bonomet, my husband, Jonathan Tynes, who's been a chauffeur, chef, and a cheerleader these past couple of days, Jerry Holland from the Judicial Youth Corps, um, let's see, April English, who is an attorney and also a chief secretary for the governor, and Caden Hall. Thank you. Before we hear from you, sorry. Here. Kevin Stanton, who is the uh, executive director of the Office of Grants and Research. Thank you. Before we hear from you, is there anyone here in opposition to the appointment of Marjorie Tynes? There being no one in opposition, at this point, you have the floor and we'll hear from you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, counselors, for the time you have afforded me through this process and for your consideration today. Thank you, Governor Healy, for nominating me to the district court. I would also like to thank Lieutenant Governor Driscoll and the Judicial Nominating Commission, attorneys Paige Scott Reed and Dara Kasselheim, as well as Valerie McCarthy for your assistance and guidance. My witnesses, the Honorable Judge O'Malley, as well as Attorney Esther Lene. I would also like to thank the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Secretary Terrence Reedy, and thank you to Kevin Stanton and the entire staff at the Office of Grants and Research. I want to thank my family and friends who have been a tremendous support throughout this process. And as you can see from my application, I have held many positions, but the title that I am most proud of is that of mommy to Selena, Jasmine, and Luke. They've given me a lot of joy and have taught me that there is a patience that I've had to. A special thank you to my husband, Jonathan Tynes, as well as my mother, Carmel, who without her prayers and the value she's instilled in me, I would not be here before you. My journey began with a young couple who left their homeland of Haiti to move to Canada and start a new life. At the age of three, my parents divorced and I was being raised by a single mother. A mother who taught me the importance of education by bringing me as a young child with her to college as she earned his degree, her degree in business administration. I remember watching my mother doing math in class with letters and thinking she's a genius. My mother is the first and greatest my mother is my first and greatest role model. She has not only instilled the value of education, but that of faith and compassion, and most importantly, the value of hard work and perseverance. My father, a mechanic by trade, remained in Canada until his passing in 2021. Although divorced, my parents remained committed to having a relationship of mutual respect, which taught me a sense of perspective. My father has remained a constant figure in my life and has been present for all of my major life events. And although he is not physically here today, I know that he is beaming with pride. At the age of nine, my mother and I moved to Boston. I came here speaking my native tongues of French and Haitian Creole. Growing up, my mother limited my exposure to television. She encouraged me to learn through conversation and reading books. However, she did make me watch Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers to help me learn the English language. Through practice and continued education, I not only learned the language, but began to learn the culture. Another show that she allowed me to watch was The Cosby Show, where I was introduced to my second role model, the character of Claire Huxtable. I knew that when I grew up, I was going to be Claire Huxtable, a lawyer, married to a doctor, living in a big house, and have five children. <laughs> that was my first exposure to an attorney that looked like me. Yet, I did not fully understand what it meant to be a lawyer. As I got older, I associated being a lawyer with arguing. So I did. I argued about everything, because in my mind, that's what lawyers do. I never truly understood the meaning of what a lawyer is or what the judicial system truly is about, until my junior year at Boston Latin School, when I was chosen to be a member of Judicial Youth Corps, also known as JYC. And Jerry Holland, who is the director of JYC, is here today. Through JYC, I had the opportunity to work for the probation department at Boston Municipal Court, where I saw firsthand the inner workings of the department. I was allowed to sit in courtrooms and observe the criminal justice system in action. On one of those days, I anxiously awaited seeing what I thought would be my first real criminal trial. Instead, I learned a valuable lesson. After the, law the lawyers answered ready for trial, 
The judge inquired why both parties could not work out a case that involved a person stealing a tub of yogurt. He pointed out that this man stole something out of necessity, hunger. He was not encouraging stealing or excusing the act, but simply pointed out that not all crimes were, were worth the punishment to the fullest extent of the law. As I sit before you, I don't remember how that matter ended, but I do remember the impact the judge's words had on me. He taught me that there is a place for and there should be empathy and compassion in the courtroom. After graduating from Branagh University, I was hired as a victim witness advocate for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. I worked with victims and witnesses in the midst of trauma. That experience gave me invaluable insight. It also allowed me to see firsthand how an attorney's actions or a judge's ruling, while seemingly, while seemingly routine, affected a person and or their families. Being an advocate helped me lay the foundation of how I interact with people today on a daily basis. My goal of becoming a lawyer was achieved once I became a member of the Massachusetts Bar. I was no longer a child emulating a lawyer on TV. I was no longer a teenager in JYC pretending to play court. I was an assistant district attorney. As I began my legal career, I was in a position where it was evident to me that I had the power, discretion, and responsibility to make important decisions. Decisions that could have a profound effect on someone's present and future. Every case, whether it was a minor motor vehicle offense or a serious violent felony, had the potential to seriously impact the individual being prosecuted or their community. It was my responsibility to make sure that every decision I made was thoughtful, fair, unbiased, and just, as well as taking public safety into account. After a combined 14 years in Suffolk County, I went on to become a solo practitioner. For the next 10 years, I represented people in various matters, dealing with ranges of issues such as mental health, substance abuse, and domestic violence. I have built my career serving people. My vast experiences have prepared me to get a full range of perspectives that have shaped me in both my professional and personal life. If I am confirmed, I will bring a unique perspective to the bench. There is a Haitian saying, tout moun c'est moun which means everyone is important and everyone should be treated as a human being. My ultimate goal, should I be confirmed, would be for people to feel heard and that regardless of the outcome, feel like they were treated fairly. In life, I have learned sometimes it takes just one word, one smile, one reprimand, or just being present to have an impact in someone's life. I am humbled and honored to sit before you for consideration for Associate Justice of the District Court. I thank you for your time and I look forward to your answers, your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Councillor uh, Eileen Duff, please. Thank you. Um, I love this statement because you clearly understand that you will, if you were sent to bench, have the ability to change the trajectory of someone's life. And to me, that's a really powerful thing. Um, in your state, you're you know, talking about a crime out of necessity is, you know, doesn't absolve someone of the crime, but it puts things in a perspective. And I personally think that matters. Um, I enjoyed speaking to you. You come very highly recommended by like everyone in the whole law world. Um, but a couple of things. Have you experienced, and if you do, if you want to expound on any of it, of working with young people in the LGBTQ plus community? I have, um, as an advocate, as a prosecutor, um, friends, family, I have uh, one case that comes to mind where uh, a, young, uh, a young woman was um, abused by her mother because of her choices. And so I was able to help her with a guidance counselor in the courts and also dealing with her mother and how to work that out. So I have had that experience. No, thank you. It, it concerns me because uh, there are a lot of reasons it concerns me, but these are kids. And unfortunately, too many times we see some of these folks in the criminal justice system. And a lot of times it stems from something you just mentioned is they're not welcome at home. And so they leave their homes. Sometimes they don't feel safe in a foster home. And they end up on the streets. No good comes from that. 
a lot of them end up in the sex trade. Some of them end up addicted. Some of them just end up stealing tubs of yoga. You know, it's just, we just have to do better. And I always say to folks, I know, especially with the transgender thing, it's a hard issue for a lot of people to get their minds around. I get it, but it's real. We're the adults, we're the elected officials, you're the judges, it's incumbent upon us to make sure our children are safe. And um, so I, that's very important. Um, folks who are differently able, not just physically different from the able, because I'm hoping, I know our courts are making a lot of efforts in making our courts more accessible than they've been. Um, we still have work to do. I think our chiefs and people around the, the court system are aware of that. Accessibility means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but also folks who might have different um, intellectual challenges or disabilities. Um, I've told the story so many times, people are sick of hearing it probably, but I had a sister with Down syndrome. If she walked into a room, you would know immediately she had a cognitive disability. Somebody else who might, you know, have a different disability, what, what we used to say on a spectrum or something like that, you may not know that. Their behavior may not be what we deem, quote unquote, appropriate you know, or, um, or whatever. So it's just, um, have you experienced with that at all or, or any thoughts on it? And again, not trusting, not going to put you on the spot, just trying to put you on the spot. So I actually have a sister-in-law who is with intellectual disabilities and you can't tell. Yeah. And I personally think she's the smartest person probably in this room next to my mother. <laughs> um, um, so yes, I have. And I have a brother-in-law who works with a lot of people who are special needs and I've spoken um, in this. Actually, I had a case pro bono with one of his um, students who um, lives on his own but has um, deficiencies, but is also deaf, which caused issues when he was confronted by the police because they didn't know and they can't tell just by looking at him. So I was able to work with the probation department and get him the assistance that he needed and then also work out the case so that um, what happened didn't, you know, didn't hurt him. And, and something you just, that's a great point, a comorbidity, where you have two different things happening at the same time. And how are the offices necessarily going to even recognize one or the other, never mind combined. Um, and again, doesn't absolve people of committing a crime or doing something wrong, but we need to make sure they're safe. Exactly. We need to make sure they understand. You know, the punishment fits and it, it's not punitive, so to speak. So um, the last thing I'm going to say to you, um, and it, it's my little lecture that I give people. I am known to run my mouth as an Irish Italian woman, but um, I am concerned, and, and I want to, while I stay on the council, I want to talk about it as much as I can, that our judges are safe, in that you have spoken to your family and your friends in your, you know, spiritual community, whatever that may be, if you have one to, your, to yourself, um, for support. Because, you know, unfortunately, all too often we read in the paper, or see on the news, some judge being assaulted or attacked, or assaulted or attacked. Someone doesn't like the sentence. They come and protest in front of your house. Um, is that appropriate? But are you safe? And are you strong enough? Um, we, you know, I believe that you are strong enough. But I think it's, I think this work, particularly um, in district court, it's so hard. And I don't think the public really always understands the burden of it. And that you, you know, you have to bring some of this home with you. You can't not. Um, and so just to reinforce, you know, to, to you know, I know you're a strong woman and you've got a, a good support system, but just to let them know that, you know, there may be a time when you really do need that. And for all of the judges in the room, you know, everyone that works in the court system too, it is very important. And, it, and it's that type of health for, for our judges and our people who work in the system, we cannot overlook that. Um, and so as an elected official, I, as someone on the council in particular, I think it's incumbent upon me to bring it up and just make it in people's minds that we have to think about that. And even I put myself as an example, you know, I, there were people on the U.S. Supreme Court I don't care for. And, and then you hear about people protesting at their houses 
But I have to put myself in check and say, is that really okay? Like, when do we cross the line of civility? Um, and so for me personally, it's, it's you know, it, there's been some hot work that's had to be done on that. But you can't have, we talk about this at lunch, you can't have different sets of rules with different people, right? I'm a rule follower. I, you know, the nuns must have beat it into me. I don't know. They didn't beat me. But, um, but I'm a rule follower. And so anyway, that's all I have to say about that. I think you're going to be a great addition to the court. Thank you. I'm waiting for you. Your name has come up so many times. Um, and I'm, again, remarkable. Kudos to the administration. Remarkable people that we're seeing right now. Just ter tremendous. So congratulations for being here and to your family as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Terrence Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I apologize for being late. I heard O'Malley was speaking, so I, that was on purpose. <laughs> no, I get stuck in a meeting. Um, the, uh, Judge O'Malley has some great things to say about you. I already talked to him the other day about you. He called me up. Um, of course, I, I already know you. I, I chaired uh, Jonathan's hearing many, many years ago. Um, when you lived in my district, um, why'd you move? Was it something I said? Or were you just looking for an upgrading counselor? I don't remember. Um, the, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, we've spoken a million times over the years, and we've known each other for a long time. And, uh, and uh, as uh, Councilor Duff pointed out, um, uh, we, you know, we've been waiting for you. Yeah, thank you. you know, we knew you were coming for a very long time. Uh, it's unfortunate it took this long, but I know you're going to be a great judge. I know that your your council, the upgrade you got, has been very supportive of your nomination as well. It's very, very excited about it. Uh, I'm going to be voting for you next week. I don't yeah. I need to belabor it. I'm gonna. I, I came late. I'm probably going to sneak out early because I have to meet the nominee for the SJC in a few minutes. So, thank you. Um, but uh, I'll stay for a little bit. But if I if I get up, don't read anything into it. It's not O'Malley this time. <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor Paul De Paolo. Thank you, Councillor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, your supporters speak highly of you. Your your district councilor speaks very highly of you. Um, I appreciate your opening statement. I just want to touch on a couple of things that impact the court and hear your perspective on them. One is um, one of the cases in your application um, dealt with someone who was uh, needed placement for mental health uh, challenges. Uh, it was uh, Roman, Commonwealth Perth Roman. Yes. And you took some steps to make sure that happened. And I wonder if you could briefly explain that and then um, that was in 2016. Has anything changed as far as being able to access resources? What's your perspective on that? I don't think we were successful in that case. Um, it took a lot of phone calls. I had to hire several experts to try to assist me to try to find placement in Massachusetts, outside of Massachusetts. He had an underlying brain injury, which also made him violent. And I believe the, um, the hospital that he picked up the assault and battery case in was the hospital in Massachusetts that dealt with the most violent people. And so now that he was no longer allowed to come here, we couldn't find any other place in Massachusetts that would take him given his propensity for violence. Um, the reason why he was able to have placement is because he also had underlying medical issues and he ended up being out of hospital. I don't think that ended up being the best place for him, but he needed medical treatment. I think as a, a, a Commonwealth, we need to do a lot better to have places where we could deal with mental health issues. And yeah. I think there's enough. And that gentleman though had an advocate who was who was fighting for him and, and doing the extra work to do it, right? And a lot of attorneys probably don't have time to do that, especially if they're taking appointed cases. This was an appointed case. So as a judge, I mean, how does that, how does this reality impact your, your actions as a potential judge? Well, I will say in this case, the judge was also aware of it and also made phone calls to the governor's office at the time to try to assist in placement. Um, so by example, I would, if I knew of, of, of a place or a placement, I would have no problem giving that to a prosecutor and defense attorney. They can do with that as they want. But I would hope that the um, attorneys before me would be able to try to make sure that their clients get the help that they need. Um, uh, the other issue I want to talk about um, is, uh, I'm sure someone else bring it up, but just regarding um, what's become now kind of old data around the Gantt study and sentencing in Massachusetts, um, 
the the not to get into it, but of course, the, the study uh, demonstrated that there was a lot of sentencing disparities going on, mainly in drug and weapon charges in the Superior Court. And you've had experience um, as a prosecutor uh, on those kinds of cases, looking at your resume, um, and and as a on the other side as well. Um, are things? Is it a pro was it a problem? Is it getting better? What's your perspective on how and why? Whether that was happening because some people tell me it wasn't, but um, why it was happening and, and are things improving? I can't answer as to why, but I can say there's always room for improvement in anything and everything. Um, what's helpful, I find as a prosecutor, I want to know as much as possible about the defendant in front of me. As a defense attorney, I try to provide as much information as I can about the client that I'm representing. As a judge, I don't want to just see a police report and see a docket. I want to hear who is this person in front of me? What brought them here? What happened? What's going on? What can we do? Um, and I think that sometimes that has been missing in the past. People are just kind of quick of wanting to move cases along. And I think you have to treat every case that comes before you like that's the only case before you at that time to avoid um, making mistakes. Yeah, you, you wrote about that in your application. You talked about unspoken pressure um, to process cases quickly. But that is, it's not unspoken. I mean, we all know how overburdened the court is. Is it, is it possible to take the time to identify that personalized information when you're on the bench and when things are moving? I think it's possible, but it's not just about being possible. You, if you don't do that, you risk people coming before you and not being treated the way that they should. So it's a matter of making the time to do it. Okay. Um, rather than put you on the spot, I'm gonna stop my questions, but, but I appreciate your time. And, uh, Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Councilor Jacobs. Thank you. Welcome, it's good to see you. Um, I wanna start off first by saying, uh, just to echo the, the others, you're very lucky to have a counselor so supportive of your nomination and um, says such wonderful things about you. I appreciate that you came out and visited with me out in Lee uh, on Monday. Feels like ages ago, but it's been that long. <laughs> it's the storm, so it all works out. Feast the of storm. storm. <laughs> um, and we had a really great, I really, I so appreciated hearing your your you you shared a lot of it in your statement as well. But your your kind of formative years story of coming from so young to be a lawyer and and then shortly after that wanting to be a judge and sort of have that have driven you and motivated you. Um, but that also that your path wasn't necessarily so easy that you really worked hard you worked you, you law school part time um while working um which is a, a lot to do which is a lot to take on and and i appreciate that you kind of um, overcame that struggle like you came through it and came through successful and the person that you are i wanted to um so actually, some of the things that I had highlighted that I was like, I wanted to like, you know, speak to you about you actually in your, you already actually shared it in your statement. So it's a little redundant. But one of the things I had highlighted that I think, you know, just jumped out at me was this quote that you also shared in your statement that not all crimes are worth punishment to the fullest extent of the law and that circumstances really matter. Um, that one I'm just going to glad because I feel like we've talked about it a little bit already, but I, I just want to underscore it because I think it is such an important perspective to have, um, particularly when you're, you know, the, the people who come to district court and what their challenges are and understanding who they are, what they've done and why, um, and what their outcomes should be for justice, for serving communities and for each individual as well, you know, sort of balancing them. Um, the second quote that I had highlighted that I wanted to talk about was this one about not allowing biases or personal opinions to interfere with an individual's due process rights. And we talked a good deal about bias in, all, in so many ways, bias, bias in the court um, and, and in our incarcerated population, but also bias um, from the attorney experience um, in other ways. But I wanted to give you a moment just to um, kind of address and talk about your perspective and, and as a sitting judge, what you could bring to the bench to affect change, if anything, around that. Just pay attention to what's in front of me. For example, if um, 
you know, I see people who look different, similarly situated, but the offers that are coming before me are, are vastly different. I'm going to inquire as to why. Um, you know, just asking the right questions, um, paying attention to patterns in the courtroom, and also hearing from people. What are, what are their experiences like when they're coming into that courthouse? Are they being helped when they're going to the clerk's office? What happened when they went through security? I think it helps to know what's going on, not just in the courtroom, but in the actual courthouse that you're working in. And we talked about that when we sat down, that you're, you have a desire to connect with community and kind of listen and engage in, in what the experience is and, and ideally use that information to do better. But do you want to speak a little about that, your thoughts around that? Well, district court is a community court, the people's court, as council earlier, but in order to improve and make sure that you're serving the community that you're in, you have to have communication and conversations with them. So you don't know if you're helping anybody if you're not having those conversations. And that's what I would like to do is to create the relationship between the courthouse and the people that it serves. I appreciate that. Um, I also underscored a couple of other things. Um, I'm talking about this, you know, the struggle, the, the, you have a section in here where you talk a little bit about, you know, the first time you took the bar and then, you know, you had a mindset shift that then led to success. Is that something you think would carry over into your work on the bench from either how you do your work or how you sort of look at those who come before the bench, the struggles that they're in and the mindset they have? I mean, yes, I think if you don't have a mindset shift, you take too much in and you can't improve or you get stuck in those emotions or those feelings. So you do have to kind of reset on a daily basis or maybe within the hour. Something may happen in the courtroom, just take a step back, take a recess, regroup and come back. Partially appreciate that too, you, you're, you're a younger nominee and so a lot of years ahead of you on the bench, ideally in best case scenario. So, you know, Maintaining that mindset refresh, I think, is such a valuable perspective to bring to stay present for each individual case. You know, it can become a blur over time. But uh, I think if you come at it from that standpoint, that's a powerful thing. Um, so I, I don't want to belabor. We talked at length. We talked about so many things. Um, and I just I appreciate the who you are, your, your as a human, who you are, your experiences are so diverse, having started first as a victim advocate, worked in, in the district attorney's office for so long, and then having your own private practice, doing criminal work for so long, um, defense work for so long, and then and then shifting it again. So you've, you've, you've pivoted in your experiences is definitely diverse and representative of a wide range of um, types of cases and, and, uh, and experience. And so I, I value that. Um, and uh, I won't take up too much more time. I'll, I'll pose my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Councilor Marilyn Petito Devaney. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming out with that make believe storm. We were lucky. Um, <laughs> um, and I want people to know how much I appreciate you coming out because um, you're giving a note. You, when you have your government's counsel questionnaire, it actually fill out that questionnaire and return it at least eight days before your hearing. You only got notice four days before the hearing. And um, I'm, I'm sorry for that. You did fill it out. And this is just a housekeeping thing. You're amazing that you did it that fast. But on 14C, it asks you, did you appear in court regularly, occasionally, or not at all? If the frequency of your appearance in court varied, describe each such variance and give the dates. And you answered regularly. So I know you, you had to do this so fast, and I apologize. So just, just send it in and send it to Valerie, our executive director, and that, that's all, because just to fix it. No big deal. Housekeeping thing. I was impressed with your writing. You like to write. Uh, that's wonderful that you do. Um, so I'm going to ask you, tell us about this writing, because it was a, a possible sexual assault. So would you tell us that about that writing? The issue before the court was um, whether or not my client's statement should be suppressed, because at the time that he was interviewed, when he was charged for a sexual assault crime, his father was brought in the room. 
Um, there was a language issue. His father, I believe, was also used as an interpreter. Um, and I argued that by use, by when the police used the father, he in somewhat was a state actor and that my client was not afforded his rights before he made those statements. And the, the court agreed with me. Um, you've had a lot of diversity in your cases. Tell us about those cases. I've had a lot of cases through the years. I've had motor vehicle offenses. I've had uh, a lot of OUIs. I've had domestic violence cases, drug cases, uh, homicide cases, gun cases, just a variety of basically a little bit of everything. Uh, is there, there has to be some cases that stand out in your mind. Is there something that that you'll always remember and um, whether it was a, a result that you, you know, that was in favor of, of, of your position or not? Could you tell us about that? Sure. There's, um, there's one case that lasted 10 years. So that will always stay with me. I started on that case working as a victim witness advocate. It was an unsolved uh, homicide in the beginning. And the main issue was the body was found um, in the Charles River and it was unclear as to who had jurisdiction on the case. And we didn't know where the murder took place, which would cause a delay. By the time we had a suspect, I had gone to law school, became an assistant district attorney, assisted with the grand jury presentation of that case. And by the time that case was scheduled for trial, I had already left the DA's office and became a solo practitioner. But I came back to be in court with the family when that defendant had guilty. Um, so you know, you've had different positions. I like the idea that you were a sole practitioner. I really love that because my own opinion is that if someone comes in and they have a lawyer, you're more sensitive to that person knowing they're paying that attorney. So maybe you'll bring her up for whatever. I'm thinking you have more compassion for those people being a sole practitioner. And you know on the other side, what it is to pay the rent and the and shovel the snow and all of that. So I think that that's a nice um, addition to your position. Um, now, um, I, I have to tell you, I got a call from uh, Judge Ireland. My proudest vote. I just, we're going to change that 70. That's awful. But um, he said, great things about you and, and he's very pleased that you were um, chosen and that you applied and I, I want to tell you that. Thank you. So, um, so when you, when you look at your background, even being a victim witness advocate. Two years, how does that add to your qualifications to your compassion? to your experience to be on the bench? Sure, I was a victim witness advocate for seven and a half years, okay. and both in the district court and the superior court. And so I worked with victims and witnesses on, you know, their car was stolen or they lost a family member. So again, a range of different cases, but being able to learn from them and the foundation that I learned from in those seven and a half years is what I've applied as a prosecutor. I always want to know more, not just what's in front of me on a piece of paper. As a defense attorney, it helps me to know more about my client and my client's needs by talking to family members if he has anyone, or a friend, just coworkers, just more information. Um, but that started as an advocate. You know, you have to get a lot of information together to try to be able to assist people, whether it's for housing needs, help with school, just different things. Remind me, because this is very fast. You came up uh, that whole fast, to, and we met very fast. We got too much time uh, as far as you know. Hearing, um, what well, I'm trying to think, was it a three-year-old incident that a three-year-old was killed? I remember that. Tell us that. It was. Um, I was an advocate on that case. It was a homicide case. Uh, the victim in that case was three years old. Um, it was. A sh it was a homicide where the individual came to the house in an attempt to kill the father. And the three-year-old came out from the kitchen looking for dad and he was killed. 
and have the trial. Unfortunately, the jury um, found him not guilty. So respect the verdict, he was found not guilty. Was that your most disappointing out of all your cases? I would say it was one of the most disappointing only because it was my youngest um, victim, a three-year-old who his life ended at the age of three. Um, so yes, that kind of stays with you. But you were on the losing end of that one. Yes. I just can't understand that. If someone came to the house and was trying to kill a father and he killed a three-year-old, and he's not responsible for that, why? The jury believed there were issues with that identification and he was found not guilty. Um, there's no appeal for something like that. Nothing, right? Well, it, I, I can't even imagine the family that actually was the letter of justice is still watching that um, family case and I'm broken. So there's a lot of injustice in the world, unfortunately. So, um, so when you look at your different positions, what has given you the most experience to go? Uh, I mean, not the combination, but just one position that you have stand out that said, yeah, that really made it for me to get on the bench. No, only because I've learned from every position. I've learned from being an advocate, defense attorney, prosecutor, even in my current position as a deputy executive director. You're just the ability to, to work with different people. You're always going to learn something. Um, so I would say all of them have been beneficial to bring me before you today. Now, you're going to be on the bench 23 years. How, how, what will you do to stay fresh up to date on the bench? Continue to learn, continue to read. Um, the things that I've done, continue to do as an attorney is to continually educate myself, find family, friends, support. Kids tend to keep you young, and the way they're acting right now, I have a feeling I have a long way to go. <laughs> um, so, in all positions, you really know how the courts run, the district court, the district courts. Do you see anything? A need in the court, something to be changed. As a defense attorney, sometimes it would be frustrating to have a client who has substance abuse issues, but the court that I happen to be in with that client doesn't offer a drug court. And so unless they had another case in another court that also had drug court, they would not get some of the services that could be available to them. So that has been frustrating. So maybe if even if a court is too small to have specialized um, sessions, it would be helpful if people would have the same access to those needs, if possible. Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you. At this point, we'll hear from Councilor Joseph for they, they voted to time me. So thank you. Appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, you have a couple of uh, fans in the room. Judge O'Malley contacted me uh, last week and said wonderful, wonderful things. And I cherish his judgment on people. And uh, counsel to my left, Chris, I know is a big fan of yours. Um, I appreciate all your service to the Commonwealth and the DA's office and bar associations and everything you've done. I think you're gonna make a great judge and you'll have my vote next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Ferreira. Uh, just to echo what uh, Councilor Ruff, Ferrera said, you got Judge O'Malley, uh, top shelf, your husband. I mean, we can't let no, him too. <laughs> can't leave him out. Uh, you know, we had a lengthy conversation. <clears throat> I appreciate the uh, time you afforded me. I don't have any questions. I think you're going to be a great addition uh, to the district court. Thank you, Mr. Porter, for coming here today. And I'd be more than happy to put your name before the council at the next uh, council meeting. Thank you very much, Councilor. Thank you. That will conclude the hearing.